Mikhail Gorbachev, champion of perestroika, arriving this evening in Havana for two days of historic talks with Cuba's hardline president, Fidel Castro. This is the CBS Evening News. Susan Spencer reporting. Good evening. It's the first time a Soviet leader has visited Cuba in 15 years. But this time, the Soviet leader brings with him policies of openness that his hardline host flatly rejects. Still, in these two days of historic talks, the communist leaders are expected to stress their common goals, not their differences. Correspondent Dan Rather is in Havana. Dan? Good evening, Susan. Well, it was a beautiful sunsplash day until not long ago, but as perhaps you can see back there, the rain clouds, the afternoon shower clouds have started to roll in, and it rained a bit on Mikhail Gorbachev and Raisa Gorbachev as they arrived for their first visit ever to a Latin American country. The Fidel Castro was on hand to greet them, of course, his beard fully in place, uh, graying a little now, but uh, the familiar Castro beard there. Now, these scenes are uh, live from the airport, a Marti airport named after the great Cuban freedom fighter, as they call him, the man as responsible as anybody and more responsible than most, and Cuba getting its freedom from Spain late the last century, an idol of Fidel Castro. Castro has always said that Marti, after whom this airport is named, is his hero. Now the anthems, Gorbachev looking fit after a long trip from Ireland. He had a stop in Ireland early on in the day, a refueling and spruce up the image visit with the Irish, and then this long trip here. Now what's going to happen is a carefully orchestrated by Fidel Castro show. The usual flowers, children, marching bands, big billboards, the kind of major show accentuating the positive and solidarity that Fidel Castro has learned from his Russian allies over the last 30 years. That'll consume most of the afternoon, and then this evening they'll have about two hours of talks, and the talks will get deeper and longer over the next three to four days. This is Mikhail Gorbachev's first ever visit to any Latin American nation. He served briefly early in his career in Canada, but this being Cuba and it being with Fidel Castro, it's special for both men. CBS News correspondent Juan Vasquez has been examining the politics and the diplomacy behind this communist summit. Eager to please, the Cubans have prepared a tumultuous welcome to underline the government's frequently proclaimed message that the friendship with the Soviet Union is everlasting. But behind closed doors, the warmth could turn cold. There's an ironic reversal of roles in this historic meeting. 30 years ago, Fidel Castro was the maverick revolutionary challenging the old men of the Kremlin. Today, he's one of the last of the true believers in old-style communism, and Mikhail Gorbachev is the communist reformer. I see Gorbachev saying to Fidel, look, you've got to uh, uh, restructure the Cuban economy. The way you're going is not the way. We've tried this in the Soviet Union. It hasn't worked. Yes, yeah, sure, we are interested in the cost efficiency of our cooperation with Cuba. But cost efficiency implies change, implies the modernization of the stifling Cuban bureaucracy that operates on orthodox communist thinking. Any talk of change makes Castro nervous. He says Cuba is too close to the imperialist enemy, the United States, to indulge in the luxury of glasnost and perestroika. Castro says that uh, history will record that he was probably the last Marxist-Leninist. But not even Castro can resist the currents of history. Castro has responded by showing a new face on the international stage. Today, the man who once sought to overthrow Latin American governments is a welcome guest at presidential inaugurations throughout the hemisphere. Yes, I think we are seeing uh, a new, more moderate Castro because we're seeing an older Castro. Uh, this is not the fiery young revolutionary. This is a 62-year-old Castro. But Cuba still tries to keep the flame of revolution alive, supporting the leftist government of Nicaragua and the guerrillas of El Salvador. Where Gorbachev says he wants to lower tensions, the Cubans are talking tough. I don't think that there will be any change on the part of Cuba's policies uh, towards uh, revolutionary movements and revolutionary countries uh, the world over. In the end, Cuba and the Soviet Union need each other. 
Gorbachev is here to reaffirm the ties of friendship, to paper over the differences, to keep Cuba as the Soviet flagship in America's backyard. Juan Vasquez, CBS News, Havana. Glasnost comes to the tropics, or at least Gorbachev is trying to bring it to the tropics. A reminder that Cuba has been a communist nation for three decades now. And on the streets of Havana today, our Moscow correspondent Barry Peterson found that while some things look and feel familiar, there's a different tone, a different rhythm. The unhappy underside of communism was playing itself out this morning at a bakery called The Popular. It wasn't. People going away. The woman is angry about waiting two hours, and suddenly so is the clerk. We've made our quota of bread today, she says, the same as every Sunday. We've done our jobs, he jumps in. What do you want? Then the final insult, this is against the revolution. Here, they blame the people behind the counter for endless shortages, but many still think the centralized government control that Castro installed can work. Moscow, they blame the centralized system, and more and more, they blame Gorbachev. Muy bueno, muy bueno. Great guy, says this man. Indeed, Gorbachev may play better here than he does in the angry cities back home where impatience for a better life is running high. People here seem more optimistic, less cynical about communism than are the Soviets. And because of that, there seems less desire to buy into the kind of reforms and upheavals that Gorbachev is peddling. The lines are long, this one for goods not available in government stores, but people don't see that as cause for change just yet. About perestroika, says this man, we do things according to our wants, the Soviets according to theirs. The living here is still hard, Castro's need for Soviet aid is still acute, Gorbachev's need to stand by Cuba is still paramount. The two countries are joined by common need, but increasingly not by communism. Gary Peterson, CBS News, Havana. It's very clear that Fidel Castro has already gotten a great deal of what he wanted out of the Gorbachev trip, which is pictures of him with Gorbachev. Gorbachev making his, Fidel Castro's Cuba, the first stop in Latin America. What we'll see in here over the next few days, a lot of, Susan, is accentuating the positive and talking up communist solidarity player in all this, of course, is the United States. What impact, potential impact, do you see this visit having on U.S. relations with either Cuba or the Soviet Union? The potential is for tremendous impact. The things to watch uh, are these and listen for, because this is what President Bush and those around him are watching and listening for. First of all, is the Cold War really in a state of remission? As we were led to believe with Gorbachev's uh, speech before the United Nations at the end of last year, if it is in a state of remission, we should begin seeing and hearing that in the jungles of Central America very soon. The second thing that President Bush, Secretary of State Baker, and others are watching very closely and listening for is any indication that Gorbachev will give the United States some help in El Salvador, lowering the violence in El Salvador. If, if Gorbachev delivers on that, now or later, then President Bush is prepared to do a lot of additional business, such as additional arms control and talk about more capital for the Soviet Union. So those are among the things at stake for the United States. Dan Rather in Havana. Thank you very much, Dan. Nearby Cuba, in Haiti, military president Prosper Avril claimed tonight to have foiled an attempted coup by high-ranking army officers. The attempt followed the firing of four officers in a crackdown on drug trafficking in the military. The rebels apparently detained the president briefly until his rescue by loyal troops. There reportedly was no bloodshed. Still ahead on tonight's broadcast, we'll have the rest of the news and news of rest as Inside Sunday goes inside the mysterious world of sleep. EPA Chief William Riley called today for a full review of environmental safeguards in the wake of Alaska's Exxon Valdez disaster. The whereabouts of the captain, whose tanker ran aground nine days ago and whose arrest has been ordered, remain unknown tonight. More on the desperate cleanup attempt from James Satori. At a salmon hatchery in Port San Juan, fishermen are making a last-ditch stand against an oily tide of devastation. Crews are using industrial vacuums to slowly suck up the thick crude oil in hopes of saving 170 million salmon fry due for release soon. If the weather stays calm, it'll give us victory. 
If the weather turns nasty, it'll break our booms and we might be hurting pretty bad. The oil slick's trail of death becomes clearer each day. 1,000 birds are already dead or dying. Also in jeopardy, the biggest concentration of sea otters in North America. The losses stunned state fish and game expert Bruce Baker. I was damned angry. Rescuers feel overwhelmed. And everybody knows it's a symbolic thing, but uh, they all feel like they have to pitch in. While fingers of blame continue to point in several directions, Alaska's governor is threatening to shut down the pipeline terminal in Valdez unless its oil spill contingency plan is beefed up. Tonight, the tanker is expected to be nearly empty of oil. Exxon officials haven't yet found a place to tow the vessel for repairs. They hope to by week's end in order to take advantage of high tide. James Hattori, CBS News, Valdez. There was terror in the night last night as two lanes of an aging Tennessee bridge gave way, sending several vehicles and their occupants into the waters below. Peter Van Sant in Atlanta has more now on the tragedy and the search for casualties. One by one, recovery teams today pulled bodies from the swollen waters of the Hatchie River near Covington, Tennessee, where a huge section of the U.S. Highway 51 bridge collapsed last night, swallowing up a semi-rig, three cars, and taking the lives of at least six people. The material down underneath the bridge washed out, exposing the foundation and undermined the foundation is what we, uh, that would be a logical explanation. Federal inspectors late today began examining the 55-year-old bridge, which had last been inspected in 1987. Among the dead, a local minister, his wife and child. This afternoon, a morning congregation asked why such an accident could occur. And I don't understand why as much taxes as we pay. Bridges and highways cannot stay in better repair. Some local residents say they have worried about the bridge's safety for years. It scares me a little bit because it could have been me and my mom and my little boy and my aunt off. I think we have like 10,000 bridges uh, in the state and there are a number of them that are old and of course it you know, gets into a funding problem. We Moore says the state will step up inspections of its older bridges. In the meantime, crews will be working into the night to free bodies and cars from underneath the giant slab. Peter Van Sant, CBS News, Atlanta. Day of the year, just 23 hours long. You see, we lost an hour with the change to daylight saving time. For many, that's a lost hour of sleep on this day of rest. For us, of course, it's a perfect excuse for an inside Sunday look at sleep. Why we do it and when we do it. We begin with what little we really know about sleep. Everybody does it. Most people would like to do it more or better or perhaps at a more appropriate time or place but everybody sleeps. That may be the reason that everybody finds the subject of sleep so fascinating. Why some even see the night's tossing and turning as art. It's the greatest mystery. It's a mystery which, which refuses to reveal itself, yet it permits us to peek into it. Mystery, you can say that again, for despite the endless discussion of sleep, no one has figured out one central fact. Why do people do it? Well, <laughs> In some ways, we don't know the answer to that, I suppose. To sleep, perchance to dream. <laughs> the federal government is spending $21 million this year to try to figure out sleep patterns and sleep disorders. This much already is known. We sleep in several stages. For some people, a lack of sleep actually may ease depression. On the other hand, staying awake long enough certainly will kill you. And though the body may feel tired and look forward to a good night's sleep, Sleep provides the brain no rest at all. We actively paralyze our bodies. We, the brain revs up its activity to anywhere from two to four times the waking state. You know, so to me, that's the most fascinating riddle of the century. One theory, the brain disconnects from consciousness so it can do a little maintenance, turning inward to make adjustments it can't make while coping with the outside world. It's not like turning off the ignition, it's like disengaging the clutch. So you stop moving, but the engine is still going. And while the engine's running, it's making dreams. Deny the brain its dreams, and they may return as hallucinations during the day. Researchers think dreams may be the real purpose of sleep, but again, they don't know why. 
Sleep is something we spend a third of our lives in. The scientific community has spent untold energy, time, um, and money in researching, and it's still inaccessible. Setting the wall clock ahead today was relatively simple. Adjusting our body clocks is a lot more difficult. That's a problem for people who sleep and work at odd hours and for their employers. Lynn Brown reports now on shift workers and helping them make it through the night. While the day for most people is ending, for others, it's just beginning. The old eyelids start falling shut. Bi biological clock is starting to tell you, hey, you're not supposed to be here awake anyways but they are here at this western pennsylvania refinery some of the estimated 20 million americans who work the evening and overnight shifts in jobs that are often monotonous with automation we're left to monitor dials and that's the one thing we don't do well that fatigue shows up in studies show that because shift workers don't sleep well they are less productive and suffer more health problems by some estimates, they may cost industry as much as $70 billion a year. We tend not to think of sleep loss or lowered alertness or sleepiness or fatigue as a decreased quality of life, but it really is. So in an effort to ensure that shift workers operate both safely and effectively, companies are turning to so-called shift consultants who design work schedules to meet the needs of a 24-hour society. Pennzoil, for instance, is experimenting with a schedule that offers its workers 10 days off after a week of working nights and bonus days off for better performance. And Rider Trucking is working with researchers looking for ways to help drivers stay alert through the night. If drivers can learn ways to fight fatigue, to recognize it when it comes, and to combat it, then we'll be much safer. Some of the most promising research involves the use of extremely bright light in trying to reset the body's natural time clock. Through properly timed exposure to bright light and darkness, it might be possible to achieve physiologic adaptation to night work. Just something you have to do and you do it. You never adjust to it. But if researchers can't turn night into day, they at least hope to turn night work into safer and more productive work. Lynn Brown, CBS News, New York. One final note on sleep, researchers tell us it's truly a moving experience. A healthy sleeper, they say, moves 40 to 60 times a night. That includes about a dozen full body turns. And they say all that activity is good for you. It helps maintain muscle tone and regulate circulation. In just a moment, Dan Rather will be back with an update from Havana. Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev arrived about a half an hour ago in Havana for two days of historic talks. Dan Rather is standing by now to update us on the situation there. Dan? Well, Susan, the April shower, and it was a very light one that greeted Mikhail and Raisa Gorbachev at the airport when they arrived, has held off a bit as the motorcade is now underway. This is a live picture of the motorcade. Fidel Castro and Mikhail Gorbachev standing in the open car through the... Uh, accolades, the tumult, and the shouting of the, the crowds that have been encouraged to come out on this Sunday afternoon. The crowds thinned out a little as the threat of rain developed during the afternoon, but uh, not much. Mikhail Gorbachev, by the way, uh, told Fidel Castro that he wanted fewer tours and more talk, and so the schedule was uh, rearranged accordingly. The plans for tours of Gorbachev around the island were curtailed to cut back uh, sharply. Mrs. Gorbachev would be touring a great deal more. But uh, Gorbachev made it clear to Castro he wanted plenty of time for lots of talk. Talk centering on economic experimentation, social liberalization, and peaceful coexistence. Of top interest to anyone in the United States is whether it applies to Central America. And of course, Susan will be here covering it all over the next few days. Thank you, Dan. That is the CBS Evening News, and as Dan says, the Evening News will broadcast tomorrow from Havana. Later on tonight, Bill Plant will be right here with the CBS Sunday Night News. I'm Susan Spencer, CBS News, New York. Good night. Meet in Cuba. 
for special live coverage, join Kathleen Sullivan and Harry Smith starting tomorrow on CBS This Morning. This is C. Next, the top man at Exxon defends his company as critics say the oil giant has done too little too slowly to clean up.